Hello, you metal pilgrims, and welcome to the new episode of our interview series with our today's guest, Tuomas Sokonen of Wolfheart. Tuomas and I will be speaking about the band's latest release, Skull Soldiers, and the creative process behind it, the band's future, the future of the entire music industry and of metal in particular, guitar tuning, and much, much more. Yet, as always, before we start, and especially if you're new to the channel, I'd like to take a moment and ask you to like, comment, share this video, and of course subscribe to Metal Pilgrim channel on YouTube or any other social media you actually hang out at to be able to submit your questions for all future interview guests. Be the very first ones to find out what is inside the latest rock and metal releases and for more exclusive rock and metal content. Here you go! <laughs> How's it going? How are things in Finland? How are you staying sane by the end of year one of all this madness? Well, the Finland is, is going into completely wrong direction. Mm -hmm. As actually today, uh, the government announced like full lockdown for three weeks, shutting all the restaurants, Again? gyms, movie theaters, bars, everything. So we're hitting almost like record numbers weekly now. Mm -hmm. So it's... Uh, they even postponed the, the the government election. Wow, that that is is uh, it's not like a small thing. I think so it's uh, it's not not a good direction considering the the festivals for the summer. Yeah, I I was hoping those those were going to happen, but I I I see more and more download got pushed for next year already, right, and a bunch of other ones as well. So I'm afraid that this year is going to be no shows once again, most yeah. likely. Like the, the smaller festivals have a chance. Like last summer, mm -hmm. there was two festivals in Finland that we even played. Okay. Like if if the festival is small enough, but they have a uh, enough space, they okay. can actually divide people and they can arrange things in a way that it, it it fits the regulations of the government. But uh, the huge festivals like Hellfest download, mm -hmm. when you have seventy thousand people inside, you don't do anything about that. Yeah. That's just how it's gonna be. So, yeah. But it's it. Like last summer, uh, we had days that we had like uh, three or four cases per day. Mm -hmm. Now we're hitting almost eight hundred per oh, day. Shit. So, I don't. I I would like to hope for the best, but it, like when thinking that with the reason, first festival would take place just three months from now. So, yeah. Yeah, man, absolutely. And this actually comes to to the first question that I really wanted to discuss with you. What do you think will happen to the entertainment industry and that of metal music in particular right after all this madness is hopefully over will we be able to get back to normal or there will be a, like a new reality we all will have to adapt to um i think the reality is going to be pretty much the same it's just the nothing is going to go back to normal instantly there's the we've been doing this like a risk assessment with our management Mm -hmm. And with uh, the guys in the band for for a year now, just mm -hmm. to, it's we have a lot of time to plan things and <laughs> think about true. things. Unfortunately, also, and also I think like band in our size, we have to spend a lot of time thinking and preparing because uh, we are not in a, in a very easy positions. Like when when things go back to normal enough, well let, let's let, let's crack the question in, in smaller parts, the business. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will have a huge financial damage. They will lose their companies, lose their income. There's nothing we can do about that because it's the second year without shows. And uh, the whole uh, music industry is very like um, their model of income is very narrow. Yeah. If you are agency, a promoter, your money comes from gigs. If you are a touring band, your money mainly comes from touring and the, and the merch sales. If you are a merchandise company, you are relying only for the bands that are touring that are printing uh, your company backline company is the same like a lot of companies that they don't there's no plan b if you yeah. are like an audio company backline company bus rental company and there's no tours then there's absolutely nothing so a lot of like a business is are going to get permanently damaged and uh but that's the 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 flip side of the coin is uh because it's part of the business world yeah. also that means that somebody will take over that spot there will be a new companies there will be hopefully the same guys are able to get the new companies running 
that would be the best scenario. But anyway, somebody will, if there's a venue, the, the company behind the venue goes uh, into bankruptcy, it, it doesn't take away the building or the facilities or need for the venue in that city. If, if the venue was doing well, that meant that there's uh, enough customers and enough like uh, people in the city that they, they want to see live shows. So when things get back to normal, Another businesses will take over those places, but what's the, like, it doesn't go away, but naturally it will hurt a lot of people that are part of the industry that we are part of. So it's a it's extremely shitty thing, but yeah. it doesn't permanently take away those, like, yeah. but the worrying thing for us or the bands that are in our size race is like the, the buffer time that I guess is going to be like half a year or almost a year when things get back to normal, because now all the huge bands are not, not touring mm -hmm. and they are scheduling their releases like uh, Avenged Sevenfold and Megadeth announced that they're gonna release their albums when the, the touring comes back. Yep. So when the touring comes back, it's gonna distort the balance of the sizes of the bands that are touring, because you have always like, if you divide the year into different portals, like you have like a six huge stores going on at the same, roughly at the same time in the same region. You have the Amon Amoth, you have the Amorphis, Nightwish, uh, Behemoth, mm -hmm. but there's always space for smaller tours. But now everybody of those like a uh, high level bands, they're going to hit the road as fast as possible. It's going to be like a traffic jam on the roads. Yeah. yeah. And the traffic jam means that the, it, it's not a normal traffic jam. It's a traffic jam of monster trucks. Yeah. And you are there with your, your small Fiat or, or Nissan. Like, you're going to get completely run over. That same is going to apply for the releases of the albums. Like, yeah. there's uh, only a certain amount of albums get the enough attention in the media with the reviews and interviews, screen time, everything. So it's... Uh, it might sound fun love for a metal fan that there's gonna be double the amount of albums. But uh, that means that the 50% that is the double are gonna get fucked up, or the, like it's gonna fuck up all the more smaller bands. So the buffer time is really what worries me that uh, we need to be very like uh, well-timed and scheduled when we start touring and when we schedule the next album, because it's not gonna be normal when it's normal because uh, 100%, yeah. man. And in addition to all of that, people aren't getting any richer, uh, and therefore, when you know all those bands are going to be back on the road, uh, they will have to choose, and they will have to choose yeah. probably two or three con uh, concerts when before that they could afford five or six during yeah. you know the same period of time. So yes, and and unfortunately, all of this madness leads to you know a chain of events. And as you said, right, it's not only the entertainment industry that got hit. All the related industries, like a bus, you know, renting company. Yeah. I haven't thought of that, but this is true. I mean, they got hit in probably the same way as uh, you guys did, or I, did, I got, or anyone else, right? Yeah. So, this uh, this is true. But there is light in the end of the tunnel uh, in terms of that you know, metalheads. Right. What? It might be a train also. <laughs> Hopefully not, man. You are talking with the Finnish guy now, so it's, uh, <laughs> don't expect always the most positive, like, uh, <laughs> here, so it can, it's a saying in Finland. Okay. So, but always, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. It's just time will tell, it's a train or... We have the same one in Ukraine. <laughs> we are, t history taught us a lot of painful lessons, so... We kind of kind of know those, but the good thing about you know, and this comes to metal in particular, that you know, metal heads cannot imagine their life without live concerts, right? I mean, unlike fans in a lot of other genres who are used to enjoying music online, uh, you yeah. know, metal heads are not, and um, and I think the first year kind of showed this, you know, right? I mean, yes, online events are okay for now, and people will go and purchase tickets for those, but only for a very short period of time. After that, everyone will be eager to go back to the real, you know, real concert and experience the sweat and uh, and uh, noise that, you know, the, the real thing produces, man. Uh, and I think this 
this just shows that maybe, maybe just uh, rock and roll will be able to get back on track a little bit quicker. And um, on that cheerful note, hopefully, hopefully this is going to be like this. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that the, the metal scene will survive because yeah. it's, it's such a strong community, like you said, uh, compared to like a lot of other style of music. So it's, uh, it will get back on its track as soon as it's possible to yeah. get that. Because we don't know what's happening. The industry side and the metal scene are luckily kind of like separated because uh, the bands will tour anyway. The crew might change, the companies behind the bands, situations with the labels might change, but when the bands are able, they want to play. That's yeah. just part of the whole thing why, why we make music and the fans want to see us play. So that will come together anyway. Yeah. So that, and that's the whole core of the, of the metal scene. So that will survive anything as, as uh, unless we lose electricity or something like that. But <laughs> that is a possibility. 2020 showed that nothing is impossible. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Have you seen that old TV show? Not old, it's like 10 years old, but there was a TV show about how electricity disappeared in the entire world right away. Revolution, it was called. No, but I, I, I'm, I really like to watch a lot of like dystopia movies and, and yeah. like a TV series. So the TV series is no good, but um, but the concept is there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Um, but you guys just released a new EP, All Soldiers, last week. Um, on which, in addition to the new songs, you've uh, you know introduced a revised versions. Let's call it like this of a couple of old ones. While we will be speaking about the new material in just just a little bit, let's start with the latter um, letter ones. Uh, the acoustic version of Iron of Cold, right? How did it arise, the idea of it, and, uh, you know, whose idea was it to record it like that? Uh, we've been talking about doing something acoustic for, like, four years now. Okay. Like, uh, we get regularly questions, like, uh, could we do an acoustic... Uh, even an album or acoustic show or something. We have a lot of acoustic parts, especially in the in the first few albums. No. But uh, it, it never really fit the schedule because we have been releasing albums very frequently. So it, it didn't have any, like, a, there was no point of doing this kind of things before. Mm -hmm. But no, the EP was a perfect uh, opportunity to try something out that we wouldn't necessarily put on an album. And, um, I've been aware of Laudis' clean vocal skills for, for years now, mm -hmm. but also it's uh, just didn't have the proper opportunity to really like uh, put his uh, vocals on a spotlight. Mm -hmm. So this, um, it was just a lucky coincidence that we were able to do the EP because if, if there wouldn't be, you know, pandemic, we wouldn't be doing any EPs. Mm -hmm. so it's, um, it wasn't planned, but uh, since the plan came to be, it uh, offered the opportunity. Uh, it's, uh, I do like, I mostly compose with the acoustic guitar. I, I really? play more acoustic guitar than the, the regular one nowadays. And uh, and uh, we did already like an acoustic show with my other band, uh, Dawn of Solis. So I, I practiced the, the arrangements mm -hmm. of, of a metal songs in the acoustics ones. And we ended up doing the acoustic streaming show with just me and a guitar and the clean vocalist. Nice. So, I really enjoyed like uh, doing very min minimalistic versions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, I think it turned out well. And again, I'm the wrong person to say it because <laughs> <laughs> if you don't say it, it turned out well, no one will. <laughs> you should be the first one to pat yourself in the back. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, it sounds sounds really good. It doesn't sound like uh, because sometimes I, I I hear like acoustic versions of metal songs with basically the guitar players playing the same, the same song shit. Yeah. with a different instrument. And that doesn't, it doesn't bring anything new out from the song. And it's like a, with Laura's voice on the, there's only two tracks of guitars. We didn't put any strings or anything like a, to make it as uh, desolate as possible and empty enough for his voice to feel mm -hmm. it. So it's, uh, it sounds also very honest. Okay. It's, it's not like overproduced, uh, but it's, uh, it would be something that we could do uh, on a bonfire with two guitars and, and his vocals. Yeah. 
Okay, it makes sense, man. I, I, I gotta agree with you, man. I, I was impressed to hear it, because honestly, it sounded like a completely different song. I, I knew the original version before that, but I was listening to the album, when was that? Like two weeks ago, when, when the label sent it, uh, the, the EP. And I was like, wow, this is a cool song. And like, I'm impressed that you guys did it in, uh, you know, an acoustic one. And then I went there and looked, and I was like, oh, shit, I know that song. But actually, I didn't recognize it at all. So... If you guys um, are set to release an acoustic LP at some point, I think this will be received extremely well by the fans. Yeah, this this has been actually in, uh, kind of like a topic lately because we did like the outcome of this song. Yeah. And it looks like we have a lot of time to focus on the music. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> again, again, so I'd rather use that like a... We did already two stream shows. They went well, but we hate to do those. Okay. It's, uh, it's so far from the actual feeling to be on stage in front of your in front of your fans. So we would rather focus on making new music and new, even smaller releases with a lot faster tempo. Yeah. I think that would serve our fans better also to get something fresh and new a little bit frequently if we are unable to tour. Uh, until next year. Absolutely, yeah. Your fans expect, after you know, a certain amount of years that you guys been, you know, out there on the landscape, uh, expect a certain style, and that's what they want to hear, right? I mean, they don't want to see a complete switch, I guess. And you yeah. just mentioned, you know, the new material. That are you guys working on something uh, specific already for the new LP? <laughs> I have uh, seven songs now okay. uh, ready for the next album, and then basically. Half of the album is already pre-produced. Okay. Again, a lot of time. But I, well, I, <laughs> I, I lost like about 120 traveling days mm -hmm. from last year and probably from this year. So every third day of my like a uh, like a uh, daily schedule is now completely empty. That okay. just count that to hours. That's a lot. So, yeah. So, but it's a. Uh, and I really want to keep the band active. Mm -hmm. It would be very easy just to stop everything and just wait things to go over, but uh, that doesn't do good for the chemistry in the band. And we did a lot of work, especially during the past three years, to start. We started touring in North America. We started touring in South America. We did Asia, mm -hmm. and uh, we were we were supposed to do our first headlining tour in Europe. We were supposed to go back to North America and South America, and. Uh, and everything stopped in a really bad timing. Like we kicked so many doors open and now things were supposed to go forward. You another... were on the rise, yeah. Uh, the previous album did hit the charts in six different countries. Yes. So we were like, really Better. like amped up. Like now, now we just work harder, but now we are actually getting somewhere and everything stopped. So if I would stop the band like uh, working completely, I think that wouldn't be good like a... Uh, Thing, uh, good thing like for the mentality in the band also so 100 percent, 100 percent. and you want to you know everyone is trying to you know be out there on a the map of their listeners yeah. right uh, and don't disappear for a completely long time and um, i completely understand you that you you know that this is the time to be productive right now uh, hopefully you guys will be able to release this uh, you know and go on tour right away but i'm um, not sure if that's possible obviously like no one is at this point well, we have a, my 120 traveling days are already set to calendar for next year. Okay. I, I have the dates. Okay. We have we have tours in, in at least in two continents already. Oh, nice. Confirmed, <laughs> but the word confirmed has lost a lot of the meaning now. So we'll see what happens. But we, we just postponed the, the plans with one year, uh, like push it one year ahead. And uh, but yeah, nobody knows what's going to happen. So we just wait and see. 107. I agree. Man, if we deviate from the type of, uh, from Wolfheart uh, right now, man, uh, this is this is a fun question that I usually ask, and I'm really interested to hear it from you, given mm -hmm. that you were just bacon uh, right now. Really interested, man. <laughs> yeah. But, what is your one musical guilty pleasure? Uh, I mean, what do you blast when no one is listening when it, if it's not metal? Like um, Britney Spears or Backstreet Boys? There's one song that I, I don't like actively seek the song. Well, I, I've done that also. But uh, it, it's, it's been my thing for like 20, 
I don't know when it came out. At least it, over over twenty years ago. I have no explanation why I like that song or why why do I get the reaction that I get. But uh, it's a uh, it's a very cheesy Euro techno song called Ecuador from Shash. I <laughs> know it. Oh my god. Yeah. Ecuador. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why. Fucking but love I, that song, man. Yeah. And I I had I did mention that few times in a, in a when I was doing this. Uh, uh, rock radio DJ guest things in Finland, and uh, and then a lot of the venues like played that as a, as an intro song. Like the, the venue manager comes to us like, uh, 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 when do you go on stage? Be like uh, five minutes or so, and they're like, I'm gonna put one song and then you on. And then, <laughs> That's funny. You know how Metallica is famous. They they would put uh, they would put it's a long way to the top before hitting the stage. Maybe yeah. this one should be yours permanently. You know your cue to enter the stage. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it would lo lose the charm if it would come too frequently. But I still I did try that out just like a, I think half a year ago, and it still has the same reaction. I just I can't stop smiling. It's really stupid, but it's. Uh, Oh, it's a great song. Maybe you should do a melodic death metal uh, cover on it. Yeah. I'm just saying. It's not, it's not even that good of a song. Like I, I occasionally I, I hear from radio bands like a Swedish House Mafia and and, uh, and RBC and stuff like that because I, I listen to this one radio at, at the car. Mm -hmm. It's not not for the music, but uh, because few of the holes that I like to hear. Mm -hmm. So and I appreciate the the level of like. Uh, arrangement and writing of those songs and uh, Ecuador is not on that level. It's not even that good of a song. It doesn't make any this guy shouting a name of a country. <laughs> but that's what make it, it makes it amazing, man. I think that, that's true, yeah. This is true. Uh all right man. And the next one can you can you share and just reminiscent of the old days and hopefully you know what will resume very soon and share just one craziest story you got on tour um, that uh, that you can legally share with us, possibly. Mm -hmm. Since I'm a straight edge, I don't get to that kind of like crazy stuff. And uh, if, if I was in the middle of a crazy stuff, it happened to somebody else that doesn't want to be mentioned. So it's... Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, I don't have I don't have crazy stories that I could tell okay. because I was always the observer. What What about the the most memorable show for you? Huh? I mean, I think it, it has to be it has to be the first uh, European festival show for mm -hmm. Wolfheart for a few different reasons. Because the first Wolfheart album was uh, released by myself. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a label. Uh, I didn't have any actual proper distribution or promotion. I just I just needed to have a stop on the music business and labels and uh and um uh, i didn't do it as well as it should have been done but i did it the way that made me feel good so that means that, like uh the promotion sucked i only have the the biggest uh, chain uh, album store in finland selling mm -hmm. that they also sell a huge amount out outside finland so it's uh, it did make sense but um but yeah, it didn't get much of a media recognition outside of Finland, and I had good relations with the Summer Breeze Festival. Okay. It was always my favorite festival when we, when I was playing there with the with the Before the Dawn and Black Sunny, and and uh, I sent the album for the for the promoter of the festival. I didn't, and I sent that in the email also and the link for the album, and um, and uh, I didn't hear anything back. Then I thought, like, it's gonna be busy. It's, it's, uh, we are, we were a really small band at that time. Yep. It wasn't even a band, really. And uh, it was just you and a couple of session musicians at that point, right? Yeah, yep. like one session guy doing guitar solos and me doing everything else. Yep. With, uh, we did start playing gigs with the full lineup with session guys. Mm -hmm. After the release, but then, then I, I wrote him uh, again an email a few months later, just like asking, like, did he get the link and. Uh, is there any like a small stage slot that would be mm -hmm. available? And I understand if not, I just wanted to drop the link for the album. Mm -hmm. And then he replied, mm -hmm. saying, like, I'm sorry that he hasn't uh, replied earlier. The, they actually bought the album. They ordered the album from mm -hmm. the Finnish store. To listen to it properly. Yeah. For the office and, uh, and uh, been listening to a lot. And uh, what kind of deal would I be? willing to make that they would want to have the band at the festival mm -hmm. it didn't make much sense for the festival at that point mm -hmm. if, to me it was like quite a big like um well it was a huge favor it was a huge thing 
for a festival of that size, they don't need to choose the bands. Bands will want to play on that festival. Yeah. And uh, it was on the second stage. It was a pretty good like a uh, day and timing. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, at that time, it was just a. Uh, album that was never distributed outside Finland. It wasn't mm -hmm. even distributed in, in Finland. I just brought all the boxes to one record store. And uh, there was like uh, 5,000 people in the tent. Mm -hmm. So that like uh, that was uh, that was huge surprise. And, uh, and, and it was a really good timing because things sucked quite badly just before that album came out. That was the reason why I buried all the previous bands. And I didn't really know what to expect. Before the dome was going really well with touring and festivals, and it, it, that point, of, like uh, if you think it that way, it was really stupid to end the band. So I didn't know what what would happen. Would anything happen? And uh, and getting to be able to play that kind of festival that early and see that amount of people, that was a, that was a huge. This is amazing. This is this is a really cool story, man. It's it's kind of uh, heartfelt. <laughs> <laughs> in a way, <laughs> Iron Man. Um, as I promised, well, you know, and usually we we end the episode with this question, but not this time. And because, uh, uh, as I said, I I wanted to speak about some of the new songs you guys um, uh, recorded for Skull Soldiers, and especially the title track. You've yeah. recorded it together with Petro Solovey, uh, yeah. who happened to be my townmate, um, actually from close by. So if you don't mind, I'll actually add him to the call. Yeah. And uh, we'll we'll talk to you guys together. Just dialing him in. Uh, but you can talk shit about him before he joins. <laughs> yeah, actually, I, I never talk directly with him. Only oh, with really? Yes. Uh, so. This is amazing. Petro, how are you? Hey, guys. Hey. Hey, Thomas. Hey, what's up? How are you? I'm okay enough. Okay enough. I, and like I told, I was, uh, I was baking keto brownies and i forgot the interview so <laughs> was it hasn't, hasn't been my sharpest day so. but this is this is i think the most uh, the coolest non-metal reason to to miss an interview ever <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I don't agree but that <laughs> happened and yeah, it just happened. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, so yeah, I'm conscious of everyone's time. So if you guys do, just uh, don't mind, the two of you yeah. just speak a little bit about how I mean, how did this concept? Maybe uh, uh, Thomas, maybe you start with the with this. Of how did this concept of a collaboration uh, with a Ukrainian, you know, band and uh, featuring Ukrainian ar artist uh, come about? Uh, it was uh, we had the cover composition. Uh, I think it was last summer. Mm -hmm. We were asking bands and artists and different, like artists in different, uh, different, uh, like um, genres of, of art, like mm -hmm. we, like painters, and there was even light designers doing light, light, like a light show on an empty venue for the song. So it was, uh, we wanted to have a, like a huge variety of uh, cover songs, and we really tried not to have a like a metal mm -hmm. thing, but uh, but uh, the Wolfanger cover of our song Ashes was just like a too good to be missed. I, I was really impressed by the vocals. Uh, I did like the, the, the idea also, they, they made like a video. It wasn't just a playthrough kind of thing. The, the, the video mood was very good. It's mm -hmm. very important to me, the, uh, the visual side also. It not, uh, the visual side always goes hand in hand with the music. So they, I think they understood the song really well but the vocals were that what really stand out and uh then uh we started talking i think uh we've been talking somehow frequently after that so it, it wasn't planned originally but uh when we were doing the ep it uh it, it had a very good like a uh, slot for guest vocals and uh a lot of my co-workers in my main job, that is landscaping and, and, and stone work and gardening, mm -hmm. most of my co-workers are Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. Been that for, for 20 years now. Okay. So, like, a uh, piece of Ukrainian sounds so much more aggressive than 99% of the population of the world. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's a compliment, but I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> in this concept, yeah, it is, it is. <laughs> and uh, adding that, like, uh, it's, it's a very cool way, aggressive language, and having that added to the album, it kind of like a high, uh, like a, as another level that I wouldn't be able to do with my vocals, because English, 
has a very like a like a clear structure and everybody is familiar with English. You can't sure. you can't do that differently. That's mm -hmm. there's only one way to do English. So it is uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, Petro, were you the one who who wrote the lyrics and uh, you know I, as I understand it, it was it stayed deliberately in Ukrainian to to underline the sharpness and differences, right? Um, it's uh, Thomas idea to make uh, Ukrainian part. I uh, just uh, translate the part of uh, the song mm -hmm. uh, to Ukrainian, but uh, I must uh, delay the little little part of the lyrics mm -hmm. because uh, it sounds uh, it was sounds not good. Okay, so and uh, and uh, how was it you guys working together? Did you exchange files over internet, or I mean, as I understand, you haven't met each other, right? This is the first time you see. Yeah, each other. <laughs> it's the first, uh, first time we got, kind of meet, so no. But uh, yeah, it was just uh, the exchanging files and and yeah. But it, it was super easy and, and straightforward because uh, I, I wouldn't need to tell him what to do with the vocals anyway. Mm -hmm. Like it wouldn't be. If there's a saying in Finland: you don't teach your father how to fuck. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a that's a that's a very strong compliment for Pedro. I think <laughs> that's yeah, great. Well, if you put it the other way around, why would you have somebody to do anything on your music or album if you need to hold their hand uh, through the whole process? So you want mm -hmm. have want to have people who add something up with their thing, and that's the thing you want to have on the album, not something that you tell them to do. So it's, uh, it was. Uh, I, I think he was more worried. I was just waiting to get the files and get it get it mixed and I knew this uh, you can hear from somebody's voice or playing instantly like uh, if, if what the quality is so it's like it was it was super easy nice and Petro as I understand you were a fan of Wolfhard from before sure when I first heard uh, the album Shadow World I was just stunned it was really cool I still listen it over and over again, and uh, other releases too. What are some of the biggest musical influences for you personally? I mean, where do you dig your inspiration from when you when it comes to writing new material for Wolfhard? Uh, it, 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 I, I'm pretty sure it goes a little bit differently than, than most of the guitar players that I know, at least, mm -hmm. because I don't... I don't uh, I don't follow or like uh, idolize most of guitar players mm -hmm. at all. Okay. Uh, I love I love drummers. I watch all the drum videos from YouTube. Like <laughs> at least most. I'm I'm very active of checking what's happening with the drum scene, and I have a lot of like uh, people that I very frequently follow. And, and um, can you so share some names of who are who are do you think the the biggest experts for you personally? Uh, well, lately, I mean, I don't know his name now, but he, he's, uh, I guess I need to link this uh, Spanish guy mm -hmm. with a huge beard, and uh, he plays huge amount of like metal covers uh, with the one bass from snare, floor, tom, and that's it. That's it? So, some symbols, <laughs> and uh, he's been rising, like he's one of the, the biggest rising like YouTube mm -hmm. uh, drummer stars yeah. at the moment, but the uh, level of his playing is also in completely different world, but uh, one one per drummer that I really really enjoy is Annika Niels. Is mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, Scandinavian, like a uh, female drummer. Yeah, and uh, I really like the the certain extreme drummers like uh, Niels Dominator, mm -hmm. Dark Funeral, and a few others. Mm -hmm. And uh, but yeah, there's a there's a lot. Okay, makes sense, man. But, and in terms of the bands. I mean, where do you look for sound inspirations? Um, any particular bands you can outline? Not, not really. I've, I've been like... Um, uh, since I started uh, like making albums, that was it's now like uh, almost 20 years ago. Okay. It's, uh, I started steering towards like this low tuning mm -hmm. stuff. Trying to like uh, detune the, the regular guitar and... Uh, and make the sound deeper and deeper, and then uh, I was introduced with the baritone instruments. Mm -hmm. So I feel like uh, trying to develop, develop my own sound that I don't really find from a lot of other bands. Mm -hmm. Like at, at the moment, all our instruments, like uh, with strings, are baritone or customized or like 
other way, example, if we would have, uh, if we would be flying to Europe to festival, the flight company would lose our guitars. There's a good chance we wouldn't be able to play because we need the very specific tuning and tools to handle the tuning. So it's uh, it's more like what my ear has been trying to find mm -hmm. in music in general. This very, I don't know any other band that is playing uh, melodic death metal in G tuning. Mm -hmm. It's true, actually. So, now I'm thinking about it, yeah, and it's uh, it's a very unique sound you guys have. Yeah, in a way. and it's and it's a very like a tricky combination when it comes to arranging the instruments because when everything is pro uh, producing that low frequencies, it's uh, you don't fit the same amount of tracks and uh, ideas. You mm -hmm. need to be very like careful because otherwise you will lose the headroom in the mix. It's mm -hmm. just if you add up too much bottom and bass and, 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 and low frequencies it's not it doesn't sound powerful anymore mm -hmm. so it's uh and then playing that kind of instrument with those kind of tempos is also a completely different thing than a, just a regular guitar uh, my thickest strings are uh thicker than the highest strings on the five string bass really yeah my <laughs> you play guitar yeah you play yeah i, I, do. Guitar. I have I a couple guitar. my thickest string is 80. okay so that's yeah, that's that's crazy, man. Yeah, and and being able to like do the fast speaking in uh, like two two thousand forty per piece per minute kind of stuff, you need to like arrange the riffs differently also to make them stand out and everything. So it's it's more like I've been trying to de develop my sound into this combination of as low tuning as possible, still actually sounding like music mm -hmm. kind of way. So it's. Uh, I haven't really found that in, in, in other, I don't know, I don't, can't remember where, where did it start, why did I wanted to do that, but it was Blacks and Ian, okay. a previous project where I wanted to do as low as possible, mm -hmm. and then with that band I run out with the tunings with the regular instruments and I started like having customized baritone ones, like my newest uh, uh, custom is, is even longer than the regular baritone. Oh wow, okay. So. So it, so I'm able to play in G tuning without any like uh, issues. I could even go like a, do a drop lower from the from the G, but it wouldn't make any sense because there's no bass in the world that could follow. That's true. That's true. That that would be too much, I think. And yeah. and in terms of mixing, as you said, it's it's it would be a headache, like crazy yeah. after that. And um, who is actually? I mean, uh, who is mixing for you guys most of the times? Uh, there's two studios that I've been using for the past 10 years. It's, mm -hmm. uh, Sound Spiral Audio uh, is the one that the mostly mixes, but uh, now this uh, other studio that we use for recording has done some mixing for us and has mixed the uh, forthcoming Dawn of Solis album. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's called uh, uh, Deep Noise Studios. Okay. And, uh, nice. yeah. and uh, the guitar player, uh, the Saudi engineer in the in the sound spiral who has been mixing my albums also played in before the dawn has been touring with us he's actually playing in the in the latest music video oh, really? he's, always, he's our main guy that if we need a session guy we ask him oh, really? he, he's already like part of the band because he's always doing the studio work with us so it's been easy to develop the sound working with the same guys and it's it's not just like a me doing that alone, but there's a lot of like a planning and discussion how we make the next album sound the way we want to make and mm -hmm. what needs to be considered. And we go through everything from the strings to different like uh, set of skins for the drums. What would be the best combinations and up like a uh, so it's like a team team effort with the same guys trying to push the same vision a little bit more forward with each album. Okay, makes sense. Makes sense. Absolutely, man. Thank you. And. Um... In terms of, uh, you know, if there would be one band or one tour that you think Wolfheart would sound absolutely amazing with, um, you know, whom, whom would you go? If, if anyone would be available at the moment, at that point, whom do you think Wolfheart would sound amazing on stage with? Are you trying to imply that there, there is occasions we don't sound Oh, <laughs> no, I'm just saying that if if you would be on the same stage with those guys who sing Ecuador, this would be this would be strange at the very least. <laughs> yeah, it would sound very heavy. It's you a, would. That is, it's a very complex question. You could, there's so many point of views like uh, 
uh, touring with Shush would make us the heaviest band <laughs> of the evening easily. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I don't know. It's um, it, there's all, always different aspects. Like uh, one of them is like, uh, what is the which band's audience we would like to play, mm -hmm. and that be like uh, we would really want to play with the uh, uh, maybe band like Amon or Mark. Mm -hmm. They have a huge audience, and uh, it would be pretty good fit for our style. But in my opinion, we would do it better than them. So it would be like that's the, that's the approach everybody needs to have. You you always challenge the other bands. Not that you think that you are better, but you work hard enough so you could be the better. Mm -hmm. You don't ever decide. The audience will decide anyway. Yeah. It's a matter of like what your attitude is. The only thing you can do is is, is work harder than the others, or at least try. But uh, but. I would like to be able to play for their audience yeah. and let them decide who is better. That would be a good opportunity and good challenge for us. But, um, but yeah, but otherwise I, I would really like to talk with At The Gates. Okay. If they would if play the Slaughter of the Soul uh, fully from the beginning to the end, then I could get to play with their, to their audience and get to see the show every time. <laughs> <laughs> you would be in a in the front, first row at the same yeah. time. <laughs> this is fun. This is actually the approach you, you just mentioned that um, you know Steve Harris uh, was talking about uh, when uh, when he did everything he could to go on tour with Judas Priest in 1982. Because I mean the the audience of Judas Priest who were extremely famous at that point already, right? And Iron Maiden are very similar, right? And they, it's pretty much the same fan fan base. Um, and the, the, Steve actually spoke about how he really wanted to challenge priests at that point who were on the rise and uh, show them that they can do it differently, but uh, not in a worse or you know better way. It's just a different approach to heavy metal that they can take and engage their audience for that. So I completely understand where that comes from, and I actually I think this is the absolute uh, you know right thing uh, right thing to do, man. All right. Perfect, man. Uh, Thomas, thank you so much for your time, man. I don't want to keep you here forever. Uh, it's, it's, it's been some time now. Uh, so any last message for the fans? Anything you want to share with them? Um, just hold on tight. We'll, we'll come back when we can come back. Absolutely. Hopefully this will be sooner than later and hopefully I personally will be able to catch you guys live somewhere on the road. I've never seen you live, I'll be honest with you, and I always say that I you know, cannot truly appreciate a band unless I see them in person and I really hope that I'll get I'll get to catch you guys either in, in Ukraine or somewhere else in Europe. I get to travel a lot during the regular, you know, non pandemic times. So yeah. We we do have we do have a date for Ukraine really? for next year also, but who we'll knows? We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. If this happens, uh, would love to welcome you guys and uh, show you around, um, you know, and uh, and enjoy the show. If not, hopefully we'll see uh, you know each other in a in, in a following year after that. Yeah. Uh, perfect, Thomas. Thank you so much for your time again. <laughs> Just as a reminder for everyone who's going to be watching us, uh, the EP Wolf Heart, uh, Wolf Heart EP Skull Soldier is already out via Napalm Records. Make sure you check it out. It's a, it's a great one. It's a fun one. It takes a very interesting take and approach on the older material, yet uh, produces some new one at the same time. And we will stay, you know, tuned for the new material uh, of Wolfheart to come. Thank you so much, man, and keep rocking. Thank you.